It was a solemn farewell, a simple, nearly silent cortege. One empty stretcher for bodies never found, and the last steel beam to be removed from ground zero. Detail, present, halt! The beam, emblazoned with the numbers of uniformed dead, symbolized what happened here. For months, it stood over the workers who combed through every inch of ground zero, grasping for final contact with the thousands who vanished at the World Trade Center. But they were also unearthing artifacts, which would help give lasting definition to our public memory. Can a mere object evoke an act of war or the murder of thousands? How does a relic become sacred? I'm Josh Binswanger, and behind me is the wounded skyline of New York City. None of us can ever forget what transpired on September 11th, but how will children who have yet to be born come to understand the events of that day? What item will make the horror resonate with them? Throughout our history, we have found resonance in symbols. At Pearl Harbor, it's the turret of a sunken battleship. At Gettysburg, the cemetery dedicated by President Abraham Lincoln. On the moon, it is a footprint that represents a giant leap for mankind. This is the story of the quest to find relics from the rubble of September 11th. In the face of all the human lives violently cut short that day, somehow the objects that survive take on a strange and poignant significance. These are the things that tell the tales of survival and loss. Artifacts are the way we touch the past. It's why we keep photo albums. It's how we hold our memories. There's the squeegee holder that cut through layers of wall to save the lives of six men. There was three sheets of drywall, one inch thick. A briefcase that landed virtually intact. It fell 103 stories and landed two blocks away. Things that turned up in the rubble paint a sad picture of life interrupted. Like the uh, lady's car that had her husband's birthday was on the 11th, and he died. And we opened her car up here in this area, and there was a birthday present wrapped in the trunk. This is a window blind, an ordinary window blind that has been twisted so grotesquely by the force of the blowing out of the World Trade Center when the North Tower exploded. What survived and what didn't became an unfolding mystery as the debris was cleared away. I haven't seen a door, I haven't seen a phone, I haven't seen a computer, I haven't seen a doorknob. There were rumors about objects that would never turn up. When construction workers said that he had in his hands a box full of menus and dishes from <laughs> Windows on the World. And a sad reminder of an earlier attack and the lives it claimed here. From tiny items like these incinerated eyeglasses to 40-ton fragments of the tower's structural steel, these are the things that can be touched by future generations to help them understand what happened here. On September 11th, as rescue teams and the nation's leaders had to respond to the unimaginable, the nation's historians realized they too had to act. By that afternoon, I was here in my office and the husband of, of, of a colleague here who lived in Battery Park City arrived, coated with dust, with a gas mask on, and told us the story of being evacuated. He put the gas mask down on the desk. We had our first artifact. As workers dug in, hoping against hope for victims to save, debris was beginning to be cleared, and historians had to move quickly, realizing that to salvage artifacts, they risked stepping in the way of rescue workers. I'm trying to save pieces of the building. Other people are trying to save lives. Or I hope that you know, some of these objects will help people to either remember it or to deal with it or to somehow 
understand it. Rarely have historians arrived so immediately to an event of such lasting national consequence or begun collecting items in the face of outright opposition. There were people who felt that we were grave robbing. There were people who felt we were looting. There were people who felt that uh, it was going to take decades, if not a century, to sort out the true historical consensus on this event. Some, however, felt the magnitude of the events right away and had no hesitation. Smithsonian curator David Shade. I had no qualms. I was concerned that we were going to miss the boat. And when I, what I mean by that is uh, miss a precious opportunity to find authenticated objects. The views of Shate and his colleagues were influenced by another momentous episode in American history, in which his Smithsonian predecessors were accused of exhibiting extreme bad taste. You have the top hat that Abraham Lincoln wore on the night of his assassination. And at the time that that was introduced, some people found that rather morbid. The hat was kept in storage for quite some time because it was considered inappropriate given that it involved the assassination of a president. Uh, but what's different, what's very different about September 11 from that is in that case, we waited until there was sufficient distance from the time to deal with exhibiting and interpreting that object. In this case, we don't feel we have that leeway. Removing any doubt about the need for historians to respond, Congress stepped in and gave the Smithsonian a $5 million appropriation and ordered the institution to go out and collect artifacts from the attacks. And so it began. The historians hunt to find ordinary objects that would spell out all the terrible nuances of that bright September day. Let's look at this collection that was gathered from someone who worked at an insurance company. One of the interesting things about September 11th, it was a beautiful day. It was also election day. So many people were voting. Hillary North of Aon Insurance decided to vote that morning a decision that may have saved her life. And what this collection of really post-it notes with Aeon on them represent is her sitting by her telephone for the next five days and recreating from memory the people she had worked with, her office, and writing them down to say, well, well we can read some names right here, where she would say, uh, Sean Chen, not found. Donna Gordano, not found. Or over here, somebody else is missing. Wanda Hernandez is okay. Wendy White is okay. It's the immediacy of it which I think is interesting. Of course we know now who lived and who died. But to be there at the moment, you know, to see somebody's almost scribbling and doodling, I think it's powerful. One object led historians to the next. Lisa Leffler's name appears on this page. Leffler arrived early that day to her job at Aon Insurance located on the 103rd floor of the South Tower. When she heard the first plane hit the North Tower and saw the massive fireball, she jumped up and began running. I had left my briefcase, I grabbed my purse, never thinking that I couldn't go back up later. A couple days later, the phone rang. I pick up the phone and, I, and somebody says, is this Lisa? I said, yes. He said, my name is Boyd Harden. I'm a rescue worker. I have your briefcase. Incredibly, Lisa's briefcase survived its 103-story fall in the building's collapse. Its contents, including her personal papers and Pop-Tarts, intact. Knowing these kinds of objects existed, historians made dozens of trips to Ground Zero and the Fresh Kills landfill. As they sifted items from the dust and debris, it occurred to them they were ill-prepared for what they faced. Anybody on staff handling materials that had been dropped off in the Ground Zero area began to cough. There was a lot of eye irritation. And we quickly began to uh, seek advice from uh, hazardous materials experts. It's a framed picture of the flag with a sticky note on it. They also had to learn quickly to cope with something they rarely encounter in the course of their work, 
raw pain. We'd never bought Kleenex for staff offices, and we really needed this because these were very moving stories. And uh, we found, you know, as professionals, a lot of tears. But their emotional task had just begun. Uh, the objects that, uh, that stick in my mind down there, uh, um, one is the buckets and the bucket brigade. The buckets that civilians, firefighters, everybody used to get that rubble out for such a large operation. It was handled with such a small item as a bucket. And it's, it just, I don't know, I just thought the irony of it was, uh, was kind of strange, a bucket. All of a sudden, you just heard uh, this, the loudest sound I've ever heard in my life. And got about 10 steps when I got blown across the lobby. And that's when I lost my, uh, my tools, my halogen and my ax. And then just the other day, the uh, halogen was uh, returned, was found at the landfill, and was returned uh, here on Tuesday. This is one of the axes that uh, our guys carried in on the 11th. Uh, it was found the next day. Um, this case here, uh, two gentlemen from, uh, two firemen from uh, Half Moon Bay uh, Company in San Francisco came. And they helped us out with a few things here. And they actually made this case. They got all the pictures of the all members here. And uh, had the ax in here for us. It's, you know, uh, something that uh, one of our guys uh, had with him at that time. You know, and it, it kind of gave hope. But uh, instead, it's still here. The ax is still here. and and. and Memories of them will always be here. The amount of debris from the World Trade Center was staggering. Each of the 110-story Twin Towers stood on the might of 90,000 tons in steel alone. Cameras could never justly convey the enormity of the debris pile that was there. Tom Amoya is in charge of the cleanup for the Port Authority, which owns the site. Amoya showed us around Ground Zero when the process was nearing completion. Currently, we're at one, a little over 1.5, close to 1.6 million tons of debris removed. Initially, we had close to 14 cranes out here, ranging from a 1,000 ton crane down to a, a 35 ton cherry picker, all out here assisting in picking the steel and. At the time, it was seven stories of debris. In the midst of this unprecedented cleanup, Tom was part of an effort to save artifacts by which the terrorist attacks would be remembered. Perhaps nothing was more memorable than the cathedral-like skeletal walls of the Twin Towers, which stood above the debris. How difficult a task was it to remove them? Where are they now? The eastern facade of One World Trade, we took that down, controlled, cut eight tree sections down where they branched off the tuning forks. We cut them into manageable pieces, approximately 40 to 50 ton sections, and trucked them out to Kennedy Airport where they are now. The Port Authority's own offices were in the World Trade Center. Devastated by losses, the agency needed outside help to save artifacts from ground zero and called upon architect Bart Vorsanger. It's a little bit as if your house is burning down and you go back and you decide what you want to save. You have a very limited amount of time. What are the things that are most valuable to us? The Vorsanger team was granted exclusive access to collect items from ground zero. Their task, to uncover objects and symbols which will resonate for future generations. What remained of the building's world-renowned sculptures, archaeological artifacts, and private treasures was a mystery. The architects set out to find telling fragments. Some of the objects that struck them profoundly were the mangled columns and beams which illustrated the violent force of the tower's collapse. 
and what was critical because there was such chaos going on that we had to precisely locate the objects we wanted and give them an a modus operandi to the people down there. Forsanger pulled in one of his young associates, Mark Wagner, to help sort through the destruction downtown. They could make an educated guess at what might be in the rubble, but there was only one way to find out for sure. I remember being nervous in the cab on the way down because I just didn't know what I was going to see or what to expect. When we first stepped onto the site and I could see the wreckage, I almost calmed down a little bit. Like, it almost became, OK, I've got a job to do. Day after day, Wagner trekked downtown, taking thousands of photographs of objects in the rubble as they were uncovered. From those photos, he would home in on items to save, map their locations in the rubble, and list them in order of importance. We had to somehow tell people in the middle of this chaos, all this debris, we had to somehow indicate what piece we were really looking at. You can't just say the steel beam on the corner of Church and Liberty until you take a large shot like this. Obviously, a little bit further back, you get a context of it, and then you start looking at it more closely um, to see if you see anything that needs to be salvaged in that pile. Uh, what's come up as in conversation is that one box column from Tower 2 that you have the American flag attached to. Uh, Vorsanger would like that as well, to go out to the airport for a uh, future memorial. Bring them home! Bring them home! Bring them home! Emotions at Ground Zero were at a boiling point. And Wagner felt himself treading on sacred ground. In the first days, the emotions were really high. Their initial response was always, you know, kind of, this isn't a tourist attraction, you know, well, what are you taking pictures for? A few minutes of my explaining who I was and what I was trying to do, they understood. And it almost became, well, come take a look at this. Let me show you something. But Wagner brought to the job a very personal connection to the men in uniform. My brother is a New York City police officer. Wagner knew his brother David was all right and had been assigned to the recovery effort at Ground Zero, but he had not spoken with him since before the 11th. I hadn't actually spoken to him, and when I got down on site, it was the first time I had seen him or heard from him, and we just happened to run into each other. He was digging on the pile, and you know, I saw him out there and started calling his name, and you know, him and his partner came over and uh, to see him and you know just to know for sure you know, that everything was OK was a huge relief. Wagner had to chase after thousands of tons of debris that were trucked out of Ground Zero each week. The beams that were tagged to be saved were loaded onto flatbed trucks and shipped back through Manhattan to JFK Airport in Queens. The thickness of the steel is so heavy that you can only put two beams on at a time at one of each vehicle because it was breaking the trailers that were so heavy. I'm finding it a little haunting because you know there's still blood on that steel. They were expecting four flatbed trucks and two large dumpsters. We'll have a crew of approximately 10 iron workers to uh, assist in offloading. They'll have a large forklift, which can take a capacity of approximately 50 tons. The steel arrived at JFK Airport, where it was wrapped, archived by the Vorsanger team, and stored. Eventually, it will be distributed to museums. Put it on top of the plastic tarp and wrap it up to try and protect it from the elements, the, the rain. Not that it already hasn't been through enough, but we don't want it to deteriorate any more than it already has. This eight-ton steel I-beam is six inches thick. It was selected to be preserved for future generations for the near-perfect horseshoe-like bend formed during the collapse. I found it hard to believe that it actually bent because of the size of it and how there's no cracks in the iron. It bent without almost a single crack in it. It takes thousands of degrees to bend steel like this. Typically, you'd have buckling and tearing on the tension side, but there's no buckling at all. 
And architects, engineers, people who work with steel, welders have just never seen the level of destruction and the level of deformation of this material in our lives. Bart Vorsanger walked us through the large artifacts his firm has selected for museums. This is almost like an archaeological process, an emotional archaeological process. What pieces can you save that are truly emblematic about the iconic quality of those buildings? This tangled mass, pulled from ground zero, was selected for the terrible hints of torn lives it contains. You have uh, communication wire, telephone wire, you have a sole of a shoe, you have a piece of fabric, this is clearly a piece of carpet, or possibly a fabric from a furniture, all fused into this incredible mass. And every person who comes here will see something completely different and think of a different story. One of the more unusual artifacts to emerge from the rubble is this rock-like object that has come to be known as the meteorite. It's this fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel and concrete and all of these things all fused by the heat into one single element. And almost like a chunk of lava from Kilauea or Iceland where they're very sharp but, but breakable shards on the end here. Most of the objects that survived are from the underground concourses, such as these signs from the Trade Center subway station. But amazingly, there is a relic from the very top of Tower One the big broadcast antenna. It was the piece that collapsed onto, uh, onto everything else. And uh, it must, I, I, I think it must have fallen far enough away from the internal fires within the center of the tower that it, it was not melted uh, into some in, unrecognizable fused mass. And there's a haunting reminder of how suddenly disaster struck that morning. This is something which spoke of the pre-September 11th life of the messengers that would be delivering to world trade. We don't know if any of these messengers were killed. We have no idea. One artifact yielded a glimpse at the life of the towers in much happier times, when the perimeter's structural steel was being erected in 1969. When they bring in the panels, they'd stack them on top of each other and align the bolt holes. Worker could reach his hand in and torque the bolts up. And before they sealed this up with the sheetrock and all the building materials on the interior face, the workers would sometimes put beer cans and you know, the newspaper that we found, the New York Times paper, was we found in, in a similar spot to this. This extraordinary item, discovered inside a box beam, offers a glimpse at a single day during the building's historic construction. Monday, June 23rd, 1969. And this is the day that Earl Warren, this is so interesting, this is the day that Earl Warren, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, resigned. And it was also the day that Judy Garland had died. An item like this allows us to see into the past and gives us a look at a single day frozen in time. When we return, Historians search for just those kind of artifacts in the debris at the Fresh Kills landfill. As I was making my search, I looked through the rubble and I saw myself standing on top of cars and trucks and buses and so forth. And I thought to myself, this must be the parking lot. But then at the same time, I had said it out loud to someone that was standing by and I said, that's not the parking lot, that's the street. And at that time, I turned around I looked behind me and I realized this is the result of the collapsed building, 105 stories, 110 stories down in the street. So what I was actually standing on top of was the street. And uh, that was very shocking to me and I still haven't gotten over it yet. By September 12th, the Fresh Kills landfill had been chosen as the site where small debris would be sorted. Fresh Kills, an enormous waste facility on Staten Island, sits across the New York Harbor from Ground Zero. New York City Police Deputy Inspector Jim Luongo and FBI agent Richard Marks have been in charge of the operation from the beginning. They've also led the effort to save personal property and artifacts for museums, hoping to keep these memories alive with future generations. Is there one 
artifact that stands out for any particular reason for you? I think the lack of artifact stands out to me quite a bit. I think uh, the fact that I haven't seen a door, I haven't seen a phone, I haven't seen a computer, I haven't seen a doorknob, I think that stands out. But for the things that we have seen, uh, every now and then we'll come across uh, a stuffed animal that might have been on somebody's desk, uh, pictures that were on people's desks that we're, we're trying to restore. The other thing would probably be an NYPD radio car, a marked unit uh, that we had up here. Uh, it was brought up here. When they unloaded off the truck and it hit the ground, the lights came on, the radio came on, and it was so eerie because you know that the guy that bailed out of the car left his keys in the ignition with it running. It's life interrupted. And uh, just take a snapshot of what it was uh, right before and get the remnants of what it was right before. Every single piece of debris, having already been combed through at ground zero, went through three more passes under the careful eyes of officers and agents of the FBI and the NYPD. We always look for three things, human remains, personal property, and evidence. The debris is dumped into the hoppers, divided up into three categories. Less than a quarter of an inch, that's basically dust, there's nothing to it. A quarter of an inch to about two inches, and over two inches. The detectives sit along the conveyor belts, and they'll pick out those three categories that we're interested in. The items found here spell out a sad picture of lives cut short. Everything from watches to wedding rings to weapons, mostly from law enforcement offices located in the complex. There's some $75,000 in cash and coin and something seemingly disposable that survived in abundance. Probably the most resilient thing we've seen out here is the plastic ID card. For some reason, it survives over all other things. After having been here for as long as you've been here, is it hard to see this stuff now taken away, to be cut up for scrap, or to go off to a museum? We feel very strongly that this stuff should be shared with the public, because it did affect the public so greatly. I'm glad to see it go to the museums. I'm glad to see it being preserved. Uh, watching it go to the scrap hurts a little bit. It's like it's being destroyed if it was destroyed. New York City detective Joseph Briardi showed us around the site. One of the most stunning symbols of the destruction of September 11th was the cemetery of pulverized fire and police vehicles. The numbers are staggering. 98 fire department vehicles, 144 police department vehicles. We lost 23 cops, so the emergency service lost a good portion of them. I look at this every day, every day it's, uh, it's heart-wrenching. While respecting the sanctity of the site, a number of museum teams came to obtain artifacts. The Vorsanger team, representing the Port Authority, had first access to gather items for the official memorial. Then, other museums were allowed in. The day we filmed at Fresh Kills, curators from the New York Historical Society were on site. Peace Tells the whole story. It says so much. The glass exploded into the passenger seat. You can see that this truck has been through a really explosive event. For firefighters, one of the most significant symbols on a vehicle is the door, because that is where a company's or squad's insignia is located. This vehicle belonged to Rescue 2. Every man on board that day died. One museum had ample space and decided to take an entire fire engine. When we picked this engine 6, we quickly found out that four men had died and one had survived uh, that uh, September 11th when they came into the city. So we also have an oral history with it. So this is an important object. But first, they had to come up with a plan for decontaminating it from asbestos. They took it to a New York State prison, which runs an asbestos abatement facility. We have negative air machines that circulate air through the system that catch any particulates before they're released outside that encapsulated area. The inmates vacuum, they dust, and they use a uh, small abrasive brush to get off some of the surface dirt. Curators rarely deal with toxic contamination on their artifacts. They're accustomed to removing dust, but if they remove this dust, the object will not bear the scars of authenticity. That's the problem the New York Historical Society struggled with 
at this jean store near Ground Zero. The store kept its window display from September 11th, still thick with dust, a striking reminder of the debris that blanketed Lower Manhattan. But bringing it into a museum creates a host of problems. If this is going to be hazardous to our existing museum collections, is this hazardous to our museum environment, is this hazardous to the visitors who come to see? We've uh, solicited, oh, you know, seven or eight different conservators from all sorts of different walks of life, from hazardous materials experts to natural his history uh, conservators, uh, people that are actually experts in dust, it turns out, uh, to come and assess the situation and give us some advice. Another delicate dilemma curators faced was how to persuade survivors to part with personal objects from the World Trade Center such as Lisa Leffler's briefcase. Basically, it came down to having three choices. I could keep it, and then my kids, my family would benefit from seeing it. I could sell it on eBay, because people always buy all sorts of weird stuff. Or I could donate it somewhere where a lot of people can see it, and it would be more of a remembrance of all my friends than anything else. So I decided to do it. Another survivor walked away with a seemingly ordinary object that saved his life. Just after the first plane hit Tower One, window washer Jan Dempcher and five other men were trapped inside an express elevator. They forced the elevator doors open only to find a wall. We started kicking in the fr first. And two men was kicking, and we can break it. I look into my bucket, and I see this crazy in my bucket. And I grab it, pull out the rubber, and start digging. To Dempcher and his fellow passengers, that brass squeegee holder became a godsend they escaped the building just minutes before it collapsed. Had the express elevator been five floors higher, they would not have gotten out in time. It's important for us because it is a, an escape tool, a tool of survival. With persistence and good detective work, David Shate also tracked down some of the precious few items from windows on the world. This is from a woman who was a greeter on the 78th floor of Tower One. One of the two uh, staff members of Windows in the World Restaurant to survive that day. They lost uh, 73 employees, all because they were above the impact zone of that plane. Perhaps the most astonishing object Shate found is something there should have been thousands of. This one probably only survived because it was in the basement. It belonged to an ice cream store. I'd pretty much given up trying to find some sort of intact file cabinet. But while I was at the compound for the Port Authority police, this ball of metal about the size of a basketball was delivered to them. You can see what remains of the uh, file folders that were inside. These were the day's receipts. These were plans for upcoming uh, birthday parties, uh, flavor mixes for the ice cream. Because the Smithsonian is a branch of the federal government, Shate was able to collect evidence from the FBI that normally would not be released. These artifacts cut to the very core of the horror that morning. Parts of the planes that crashed into the Twin Towers. Here, for example, is residue of a hatchway from the fuselage of one of the two planes. The flush rivets tell us it's from the outside of the plane. Here, a piece of ripped skin from the same uh, part of the plane, probably. You can see the thinness of it, the light weight, all the characteristics of airplane aluminum. Looking out through one of these shattered windows, uh, I feel the uh, little bit of the sudden sense of helplessness that they must have felt in these hurtling bombs. All I remember was uh, the silence. Uh, of the scene. Uh, there, it was extremely silent. I thought what I expected to see was nothing like what I actually did see 
at the time of my arrival uh, at the site. Uh, there wasn't much that you could say, you could describe. Everything was, uh, everything was dust and metal. There was, there was no typewriters, there was no chairs, there was no, there was no nothing. Everything had been, uh, everything had been crushed. I saw it too much, as, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, things that I'll never forget uh, in my life. If I never see another artifact from the World Trade Center, that would be okay with me also. Uh, but it, it would be unfair for future generations to be cheated out of a piece of history. I remember seeing our apparatus. Our apparatus was uh, absolutely crushed in a front. And uh, by the time I got there, it was on fire. Uh, it was pretty devastating to see that, like, uh, symbolic of uh, the whole company. We did uh, salvage, this is a new truck now, we did salvage signs off the, the sides of the uh, ladder. The sign that you're looking at here was on the original rig. I know I speak for the rest of the company. Having it on the aerial ladder is important to us. Uh, it's a, a remembrance of what happened down there, but it's also, I think, a way of uh, keeping the spirit of the 12 guys from Ladder 3 and Battalion 6 alive. They were buildings New Yorkers looked up to in more ways than one. They were a center of commerce, a place to work, a tourist attraction, and a pedestrian compass. The World Trade Center was also home to some of the world's most invaluable treasures. The World Trade Center stood as a testament to boldness in human spirit. The architecture was born of soaring ambition and confidence in engineering. The Twin Towers were supposed to be impenetrable. As such, they safeguarded gold and paper currency in the hundreds of millions, precious artifacts, and masterworks of art. I think when most of us think about the World Trade Center, we think about offices or restaurants. We think of a place of commerce. But there was much more there. When teams of historians and engineers began searching, they had no idea what survived and what did not. In the chaos, rumors sprung up about discoveries seemingly too good to be true. We had read some article of a table full of clocks that had all stopped um, on or about, you know, the time that the planes hit, and these clocks were supposed to be out of fresh kills, and, and there really wasn't anything like that. Um, it was all just rumors. One lingering question was what happened to the gold? The Bank of Nova Scotia's vault held $200 million worth of gold and silver bars. It took months to reach it, and Tom Amoya was on site when the vault was finally located. It was amazing, really. Um, the, vault was, um, the vault was fully intact, uh, with the exception of the loss of power. When we came through and dropped power to it, and the doors opened, the security system went back on, the lights were on. It was like standing in a time warp. There's a hair on the back of your neck to stand up. This is just an eerie feeling. But there were other items that would never be found. Irreplaceable personal letters and papers from Helen Keller, as well as artifacts from two of New York's most important archaeological digs, the Five Points neighborhood and the African burial ground. Another major loss was the entire body of work from photographer Jacques Lowe documenting John F. Kennedy's 1960 presidential campaign and years with the Kennedy family. He had the gift of seeing John F. Kennedy and his family in a very personal way. The family was relaxed with him. So there are actually thousands of images that could give us insight into the family as well as as historical moments when Lowe was there and photographed the president that that we've lost now and won't be able to see other historic treasures lost for good were from the twin towers world-class art collection saul winograd had the honor of selecting art for the world trade center when it was being built in the aftermath of the disaster he became an invaluable resource in helping find what was left in keeping with the grandeur of the towers themselves, Winograd enlisted the most prominent artists of the day to create custom works for these ambitious buildings. Juan Miró, Louise Nevelson, and Alexander Calder. This is what we had prepared for the people working at the site when we wanted them to look 
uh, for the culture, and we did this for each of the artworks here. The Port Authority's archives were decimated in the Twin Tower collapse, leaving Winograd with the only surviving map of where the public art was located in the buildings. So this, in a sense, served as almost like a treasure map. Exactly. We put together a schematic. As a result of that, we did find some portion of the Calder, which was at Seven World Trade Center. All the public art was destroyed, with the single exception of the Fritz Koenig sphere, seen here in the middle of what would have been the main plaza. There was all sorts of debris in it. The top had been seared off. I was really devastated by it. I was devastated by the, everything that I saw. The sphere weighed 20 tons and was brought to nearby Battery Park, where it was displayed as a memorial. Throughout history, art has served to memorialize the dead. Sculptor Ellen Zimmerman designed the memorial for the victims of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. It was created to ensure there would be a permanent place to mourn those history might not otherwise remember. The piece was meant to sit exactly over the spot where the bomb had gone off. The names of the six who died in 1993 were etched in red granite around a flowing fountain in the main plaza. The memorial was destroyed on September 11th, and the families of the 1993 victims feared their story, too, would be lost. Do you feel like people forgot about 93? I, I think they did. Only now I think they're starting to wake up. Now that they've publicized it on television and all, I think now they're coming around and saying, yes, let's see what we do for 93 people. I hope they do something. This was like uh, a terrible um, double loss for the families that had lost their loved ones in 93. But in December, a poignant discovery was made, a piece of red granite engraved with the name John for John Di Giovanni, one of the six victims of the 1993 attack. The only fragment of the 1993 memorial had been found. In 2002, on the ninth anniversary of that bombing, victims' families gathered at a memorial service around this now doubly sacred relic. When we come back, we'll look at the nation's response to September 11th. Please, God, have fun. <laughs> Things that should be in a museum can't be put in a museum. The, the souls of those people that were working down there and who died down there. Because I never seen such people come together like that in my whole life. It was just amazing to see all those people working down there. If you could find a way to put that in a museum, that would be the thing to do. One World Trade Center relic that many Americans are familiar with was featured on the cover of Newsweek magazine. In the aftermath of the September 11th attacks, a New York City firefighter reportedly took the flag from a yacht called the Star of America, which was docked in the Hudson River, not far from Ground Zero. The flag still smelled of smoke when it was transferred and raised aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt, an aircraft carrier bound for Afghanistan. I'm Catherine Jacoby, a volunteer with the American Red Cross. Like many, I reacted to the events of September 11th with great pain and sorrow. Since that day, the world has changed a lot, and we've changed with it, coming together with purpose and hope. All of us, your concern and caring has led the way. To every one of you who has helped another person during their time of need, America salutes you. Keep that spirit alive. September 11th, one year later. This unparalleled event has been documented as only the History Channel can and is now available for purchase. For information on our September 11th a Look Back Home Video Library, visit shophistorychannel.com. On September 11th, pain and sympathy filled the streets of New York City. Thousands of photocopies appeared with names and faces of the missing. Clusters of candles were placed on corners, in windows, and on doorsteps. And the city's parks were filled with mourners. This collective outpouring of grief may in and of itself become the lasting symbol of the nation's tragedy. 
a hundred years from now, people are going to find almost as much power in it as we do now. The death of each one of those people reverberated through so many thousands of other people and have changed and diminished their lives in ways that they will never completely recover from. Immediately, New Yorkers flocked to donate blood and volunteer. At Ground Zero, an intense brotherhood developed among those working side by side. It's heart wrenching. I've been here every day for months, you know, and, and the people, uh, I can't imagine not, not seeing them. Would you come here? Again, you know? Those who witnessed what happened at Ground Zero left with a permanent memory, greater in value than any artifact that may have been retrieved. The way people were interacting, the way everyone was helping each other, the guy that offered me a hot meal, all the different things that were going on down there are so, so much more important than individual objects for me. This historic chapel, St. Paul's in Lower Manhattan, has borne witness to moments in our nation's history. Its parishioners saved it from the Great Fire of 1776, and President George Washington knelt here in prayer after his inauguration in 1789. Now, it has a new story. When the towers fell, this little chapel stood firm. And just days after the 11th, it opened its doors to become one of the many sanctuaries for rescue workers downtown. The outpouring of love has far surpassed the hatred of September the 11th. Lawyers from principal law firms in this city were serving coffee and giving aspirin to the police officers, to construction workers. It has been so extraordinary. As part of their efforts to capture the story of compassion and caretaking here, historians have come calling. Here are some of the bins of supplies that were donated from all over the world, bandages and dog biscuits and Band-Aids and so forth. We're talking about uh, people, communities that were lost on September 11th, and we're also talking about communities that were created as a result of September 11th. Well-wishers left mementos of sympathy and concern, blanketing the fence around St. Paul's. But there is one item the clergy asked curators not to take, a cane hand-delivered by an elderly woman. She heard that a man working in Ground Zero had hurt his leg. She got on the subway in the South Bronx and came all the way down to southern Manhattan, talked her way through the police lines, which at that time was no small feat, came into St. Paul's Chapel and gave us her own cane. And then she hobbled off. This cane, the squeegee, the briefcase, all show us how some lives were touched by grace on September 11th. The broken sculpture, the warped window blind, the twisted steel beams remind us of all that was destroyed. The most powerful artifacts are the ones that symbolize the thousands of lives lost. One day, one of these items may be the single symbol by which future generations remember and come to understand the terrorist attacks. When the memorial is eventually built, it may be one of the most significant in American history, but its location, design, and size have yet to be determined. It was not until 1962, some 21 years after the Day of Infamy, that a permanent memorial was dedicated above the USS Arizona in Pearl Harbor. A World War II memorial in Washington has yet to be completed. In New York, some people feel a need to create a monument immediately. But it may take some time to place the attacks in proper perspective and determine what the lasting symbol should be. What really makes a great memorial? The more I began to think about it, I realized there's no, there's no particular formula. Normandy, which I visited last summer, for the first time is unbelievably moving, just incredibly emotional. So much of what we are collecting from Ground Zero come to us in the form of fragments or ruins. 
ruins tend to evoke feelings of melancholy or wonder. This is what the fragments of the World Trade Center will be evoking for people. The absent whole of lives, of buildings, uh, of communities, transportation, cultural hub that just doesn't exist anymore. This very important cultural landscape is gone. For America and the world, the attacks of September 11th were so horrific that we felt an urgency to demonstrate our collective grief. We need to show how hurt we are, how strong and resolute we are, and in many ways, we have come together. But it may be a while before we can form a consensus on what a proper memorial should be, a memorial that will be visited by the children of tomorrow, one that may make them stop and say, I wasn't born before September 11th, 2001. I did not see it happen, but I remember.